Greetings, everyone. A few years ago, we were wrapping up a vacation at Hawaii. It's a family vacation. At the airport, bags in hand, I suddenly realized, oh my God, I left our passports at the hotel. Okay, happens once in a while, right? And later on, I started forgetting the names of the people I would interact with. You know, it didn't happen every day, but noticeable enough, it was there. And I asked my neurology friend, hey, what if this happens to me every day? I start forgetting things that normally I do. He just smiled and said, it's okay. It happens with aging. I said, what? Now I need help. I said to myself, can I find some solutions for this? Do I want to really live with that? You know, okay, the thought process went on. Now you all have young kids at home. They go to high school. You've seen their stress. And there are younger adults. They're more anxious than ever. And older adults, you look at their face, you wonder, where is their joy? What happened to them? And enter COVID as an anesthesiologist and also a contemplative science researcher and running the center, I often encounter patients, especially with long COVID, struggling with brain fog. They go to their car and they wonder, oh, what should I do next? Should I open the car? Should I drive? Really, there are patients like that. I just started thinking, what if there's a common thread behind chronic illness like COVID, long COVID, or stress, anxiety, aging? It occurred to me that there is this slow fire that is burning in your brain, not large enough to recognize, but surely and slowly they are burning down your neurons and the supporting structure and accelerating your memory loss and your fear, your anxiety, your stress, and also the aging process. So what is this growing fire that we are thinking about? What is this common theme that is happening, right? It happens that this name of this kind of problem that is happening is called neuroinflammation. And this is something that we often ignore it happens in the young and it happens in the old. It can accelerate the memory loss. It can worsen your anxiety. It can worsen your stress. And above all, it can be facilitating even Alzheimer's dementia. It's important to note that. Not just that, how you eat, when you eat, what you eat. If you don't do that right, it can add fuel to this fire. And think about if you don't have a good night restorative sleep, it also adds fuel to the fire. And if you're fully deprived of joy, that also adds fuel to the fire of this slow decline that is neuroinflammation. They don't just wear down the body, they inflame the brain. If you think of that as experience of life over time, it's like a horizontal line. You have ups and downs in your life. Now add neuroinflammation to it. This line declines. The profoundness of experience goes down. You don't feel the same. You don't experience everything the same. We can slow this slide. We can cool this fire. Today, I invite you to join a journey of mine from inflammation to insight. As an anesthesiologist, my job is to ensure that you don't feel anything. You don't feel the pain, right? You don't feel the surgery. Your vitals are stable and you have a very clear-headed recovery. But as a clinician scientist, especially focused on neuroscience and also a professor of anesthesiology at Harvard Medical School, I want to look beyond the operating rooms. What does the surgery cost inflammation do to your brain, right? Especially in vulnerable patients who are older and who have pre-existing dementia and who have these chronic conditions. It seems that the surgery produced inflammation can actually accelerate the neuroinflammation that happens after your surgery and trigger the cognitive decline at a much rapid pace. It's not a trivial thing. As a clinician scientist, I started the Sadhguru Center for a Conscious Planet in 2020. I direct this center. My job is to find holistic solutions. We're trying to bring spirituality and science together. How can we bridge these two? And my job is to find these holistic solutions. And it seems meditation that is so rooted in Indian traditions, refined over millennia, can offer such a solution for us, especially if it is delivered in a contemporary way and if it is made more accessible. Many people will take it 
and this can be the solution that can cool the fire of neuroinflammation. What else can be a stress test for these meditators? A pandemic stress test, right? Once in a century pandemic. We looked at a group of meditators called Inner Engineering Meditators, specifically doing a practice, which is a 21-minute meditation process, which combines alternative nostril breathing, chanting, rapid breathing, and breath watching. This is a multimodal tool. More and more people are recognizing using such multimodal tools are very beneficial, not just for their individual components, but when they all add up together, they clearly synergize. We looked at 5,000 people who are doing this meditation at the time of the pandemic, even before the vaccine was announced. They were practicing it five days a week for at least six months or longer and compared it to 2,500 people from similar zip code and of the same age group and gender mix and also doing similar work. So somewhat comparable groups. What did we find? They had the lowest levels of stress, not just once, repeated it after four weeks and another four weeks, so three time points, even before the vaccine was announced. So they were not just surviving, but really thriving. It's not just about the stress. It is also about the well-being. They had the highest levels of well-being at all these three time points. We wanted to see, oh my God, let's just take a bunch of meditators who come for an eight-day meditation retreat. This was a very impactful meditation. It's eight days. We took their blood samples from over 100 people before and after. We measured what is known as C-reactive protein. It's a marker of inflammation, right? The C-reactive protein can tell you how inflamed your body is. We took these people over six months and we measured it at four time points. We compared their markers to that of their households, spouses or significant others who are living in the same house, but not doing any contemplative practices. What we saw was really surprising. Their C-reactive protein was one-third of that of the controls, one-third. When there is no external infection or an invasion, having a one-third of CRP just tells you you're at a low inflamed state. We wanted to dig deeper. We took these blood samples with the help of our collaborators who led this work. We looked at transcriptomics, a way the genes actually translate their message to proteins, right? In between, that's the transcriptomics. When we looked at it, look at this graph. On the left are those people with severe COVID. In the center, it's all blue and tiny dots. Blue means down-regulated genes. There's a set of genes called STAT genes. These are the genes that are responsible to fight against COVID, and they were down-regulated. These people really had a problem. Compare it with the right side. These are people who are meditating from this retreat. Their central piece, their bubbles are actually bigger and red. That means they're upregulated stat genes. This was published in one of the big journals in, uh, called Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences. We wanted to go further. This is an ongoing work in our lab. And what we saw was the blood proteins. Now, what happens to the proteins themselves, right? On to the right, you see the yellow proteins. Actually, the proteins called HAM, they went up. These are the proteins that fight against this viral infection. And on to your left, those in the purple color or those proteins that go down. When there is no external infection, the inflammation is very low. This is exactly what we want. You should have low inflammation when there is no infection. And when you have an infection, you're ready to fight the infection. Think of autoimmune disease. At baseline, they have their own body acting against them. Their inflammation is revved up. This is basically doing the opposite. So meditation can cool the fire of neuroinflammation. This was done in over 5,000 proteins for us from a single drop of blood with cutting edge technology. So we are actually in a position to fight against infection when that happens. Maybe when the next pandemic comes, maybe you can prepare yourself for that. Not just that, same set of people, they gave a surprising specimen for us. There was two, more than 100 people. We measured over three months time point, before and after. This tool actually showed the gut microbiome mix. And actually, you see that their gut microbiome was better. It had what is known as lactobacillus and other good bacteria in them. 
So that means gut inflammation was also reduced. Now, gut is being more and more recognized as a second brain, and it is good to have a good gut microbiome. They can influence you, how you think, how you respond, all again, using the neurotransmitters that can just go to the brain and influence that. So you have a better gut as well. We wanted to move from inflammation to insight. So we looked at the same set of meditators and scanned their brains. This is called functional MRI. This is cutting edge technology again. This work was led by our collaborators. On the left side of the screen is the brain at rest. So those which is marked in the back are basically what is known as default mode network. That is another name for mind wandering. How many of you have been having that problem? Your mind always wanders. Something is happening in the back of your brain all the time, right? In the front of the brain, you have a switch center called the salience network. And in these people, at baseline, the connection between the switch and the mind wandering center is enhanced after meditation. So you can actually switch it between the two, whether you're going to do the task or whether you're going to go to the mind wandering states. So better connection ability. And on the right side, when they were doing the task, that is breath watching, it's a task. And when they're doing the task, within that mind wandering center, within that, there are two, three centers there, that connection goes down. When that connection goes down, that center activity goes down. When that activity goes down, you're not mind wandering, you're actually doing the task that you're supposed to do, that is breath watching. Meditation just doesn't calm your brain, but gets control over it. You're not just a monkey brain. You will actually do what you want to do, what you want it to do, right? So that's a way to sharpen your tool. And now we wanted to go one step further. We want to see connectivity of these brain areas, right? This is using a simple meditation called Shunya meditation. This is only for 15 minutes. And this is called a conscious non-doing process. Think of all the social media activity that goes on so much information coming at you. You have to be ready what to filter and what to focus. With so much of information that is coming at you, you better have that skill, right? There is a lot of information that doesn't even deserve your attention, leave alone the emotional energy, energy attached to it. So with this meditation, when we did this functional MRI scans and looked at their connectivity, we can see that the long-range connectivity was enhanced and there was a better integration of the brain itself. This is something that happens with a sound sleep. When you have a good restorative sleep, you can have those kind of connections re-established, long-range connections and integration. All that with just a 15-minute meditation process. You can get that good night's sleep right here, right now. You have a better brain. Our collaborators and other people have shown that. And from a group from Harvard has shown that with meditation, actually, the brain thickness goes up. The cerebral cortex thickness goes up a better function, a better connectivity. Now you have a better tool, which is your brain, to do what you want to do. We went one step further. We collaborated with neurology friends from another Harvard hospital. They had this big database of 25,000 people who come in for mild cognitive impairment or dementia to their hospital, and they developed an algorithm. With that sleep EEG algorithm, they could tell what is the brain age in relationship to their chronological age. That difference is called the brain age index. And here you can see people with dementia and mild cognitive impairment, they were 15 years older than their actual chronological age. Now we took this bunch of meditators who came for this eight day meditation retreat and we, looked, we took their sleep EEG and used the same algorithm in this meditators. What we found was just very, very surprising. They were six years younger, you know, brain age compared to somebody who didn't have any disease. Now let's take that and compare it with people with mild cognitive impairment and dementia. You are 15 to 20 years younger. This is worth repeating. Six years younger. Now you have a good thickened brain with meditation, good functions, good connectivity, better integration, and six years neurobiologically younger brain. With a meditation, you can also influence to stick to a dietary plan that you want to have. Several people who live in these monasteries actually eat only twice a day. And they, most of their food, 50% of the food is raw plant-based diet. All of this 
meditation, diet, good sleep, and joy basically adds up and all leads to a healthy brain. After I mentioned about the connectivity, etc., there are a group of people, we took their blood samples with a four-day retreat and measured what is known as endocannabinoids. These are something that is produced within your body. And anandamide is the name of this molecule. It's otherwise known as bliss molecule. And that is the Sanskrit meaning of this word anandamide. And that goes and acts at the joy center, the bliss center within your brain. So now, as I mentioned, again, repeating it, a good thickened brain, a good structure, good function, good connectivity, well-integrated, younger brain, wrapped in this pleasant state. You all know when you are in a pleasant state, you can actually listen to people. You're very receptive. You're very accepting. Now, that is the tool that you actually prepared yourself. You have this ups and downs in life that happens. It's like a flat line, provided you don't have any neuroinflammation. Now, you have this awareness that comes in with meditation. Your line and profoundness of experience actually goes up. Your lows are not that low anymore. Your highs are high. And it's all coming from within. You don't need an external agent to create this bliss for you. This is basically what we want. Until we take the last breath, we want to be aware. So ladies and gentlemen, it takes just three minutes. You look at this graph, especially the last one with the brown and the red figures. At three minutes, when you start doing the breath watching, you start seeing the EEG signatures in the brain that is representative of meditation. At about seven minutes or so, it peaks. It lasts for almost 14 minutes. The slide is in courtesy from Nimans, our collaborators. And really, what are you waiting for? When we reduce neuroinflammation and when we rewire the brain, when we cultivate awareness, we aren't just surviving, we are thriving. This is a gift to be born as a human and let's experience life for all its profoundness. Time is short. Thank you so much.